Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 86 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Today, I have a very interesting guest on the show, Marcus Koval, and we'll get to that interview in just a moment, right after our martial arts quote, and that is, love is the highest art. In ancient times, you trained so hard, not for the sake of killing people, but for the love of your family, for the love of your mother, your father, your children, your tribe, and your body. It is the love of life. That's why we train so hard, so you can preserve life. And that's from Guru Dan Inasanto. What a great quote. Okay, black belt martial artist Marcus Koval is the lead MMA training instructor and owner of Systems Training Center. Marcus is an accomplished professional MMA fighter and professional kickboxer and has lived and competed all over the world. He's also the founder of Liam's Life, an organization dedicated to bringing awareness to the epidemic problem of drunk driving in the U.S. He's going to talk about his mission to spread the word about drunk driving as well as organ donation and tell us about his background and history in the martial arts. So I know you're going to enjoy this interview with Marcus so without further ado, let's talk to Marcus now. Okay, I'm speaking with Marcus Koval, lead MMA training instructor and owner of Systems Training Center. He's also the founder of Liam's Life. So welcome, Marcus. Thank you very much. And thanks for uh, taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you for having me on. My pleasure, sir. So let's, uh, let's start with Liam's life, a very, very important and very personal cause for you, Marcus. And I guess to get to Liam's life, we need to know about Liam and his story. So please tell us uh, about your son, Liam. Yeah, Liam uh, uh, was my son. He is my son still. He'll always be my son, but... Liam was taken from us on September 3rd, 2016 by a drunk driver, a 72-year-old woman that was driving drunk at 3.30 in the afternoon, who, uh, which left, left uh, she hit my son and my niece, oh, my, my sister-in-law, my, 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 um, my wife's sister, who's 15. Um, when they were crossing a pedestrian crossing, they'd done every, everything right, they I pressed the button and waited, and this seventy-two-year-old woman uh, plowed through the intersection, the crossing. Uh, they left my son brain dead, and he was declared dead twenty-four hours later, fifteen months old. And um, this woman uh, tried to flee the scene. She tried to take off, mm -hmm. and uh, she was later arrested by some civilians who did a, civ a civilian arrest on her, which I will forever be grateful for. Um, and uh, it's, it's it's been a rough year, obviously, but that was the the reason why we founded Liam's Life, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that we we started. Man, I my heart goes out to you for sure. I can't even begin to imagine losing your child like that. Um, it's uh, it, again, my heart really goes out to you. Thank you, Marty. It's uh, 
I don't think there's a worse pain on this planet. You know, there's, it, it's, yeah, I, I'm a very even tempered person and uh, I've never had mood swings or depression or anything like that. But uh, it's been a rough year where I've learned a lot about myself. I think I had pretty decent values before what's important in life and uh, when it comes to family and friends and relationship and, and so on. Uh, relationships not just with my spouse but with friends and, and so on. But it really put things in perspectives and, and, and I really, you know, had to to analyze myself as well and, and um you know, from loving what I do and I still do and, and I always have done, you know, being in the martial art world, but to struggling with getting out of bed in the morning just because it's like life's over, you know. Nothing nothing is more important than the life of your child. Nothing sure. compares to it and all of a sudden dealing with, with the feelings of hopelessness and meaninglessness and, uh, um, it, it, you know, it's kind of ironic because being a martial artist uh i've i've always felt that calm that a lot of martial artists speak about that you know you know you can take care of yourself and and your loved ones and if someone had told me that a 72 year old woman was going to take my son's life i i would have laughed you know but it's um it's it it made me realize how important it is to bring up the topic of drunk driving and this country has a serious problem with drunk driving and uh, I'm, I'm from Sweden originally a country where we have zero tolerance and when I came to the United States and and saw that people were drinking and driving it was something very new to me uh, but I didn't realize then how much of a problem mm -hmm. it is I didn't know I didn't know then that someone dies in this country every 53 minutes because of drunk driving wow. There's, that's the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every single week. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It is a huge, huge problem here. When Go back for a second. When you say Sweden is zero tolerance, what what are the ramifications there for driving drunk? Well, um, you know, drunk driving, I, I would say, first of all, there's, it's harsh laws and over here for sure, but still not that harsh. It's more so about the social attitude towards drinking and driving. People just don't do it. Even, you know, criminals don't tend to do it. And don't get me wrong, you know, you know we, it happens. We have drunk, we have uh, alcoholics, we have drug addicts as well that don't care what the limit is and they will get behind the wheel. But per capita, we have a third of the amount of drunk driving accidents and incidents that the United States has. And the the thing is, it's it's not you know over here you know people speak openly about having duis and I've, you know people have two or three duis and they're okay with it whereas in sweden it's an embarrassment it's it's shameful to have a dui mm. uh people lose their jobs because of it they lose friends and family because of it and um it, the, the the actual blood alcohol content in po is 0 0.02 uh in, in sweden but it's the same as, as zero tolerance. You know, you can drink one beer mm -hmm. and you have to wait an hour. And the reason why they set it to 0 0.02 is because, you know, if you have mouthwash, it would actually show on a breathalyzer. Mm. So, you know, you, you drink, you drink and drive, you get caught. First of all, it's a very hefty fine. Um, you lose your license or for, for you, you, your license is suspended for a while. But another problem that this country has is the repeat offenders. Whereas in, in Sweden, you drink and drive once, you get a second DUI. Now the ramifications are a lot worse. You start, you you will have to go to AA meetings. You have to um, stop proving and showing that you're not drinking and driving. Otherwise, you lose your license. Wow, you're right. I, I've known several uh, repeat offenders. In fact, I used to have a good friend who had a brother, and I swear he must have had like four DUIs and still was still driving around. It was, it was crazy, but this is that's one of the Go ahead. yeah it's it's one of the problems in in, in the U.S. that you know you have DUI lawyers, which mm -hmm. th that's the whole job. You know, in my opinion, is the scum of the earth because uh, I understand the need for defense lawyers. You know, you, because in a, in a democratic society, you need that. Even the worst of criminals have rights that need to be followed, but their only job is to find loopholes loopholes in the law where 
it makes the police job harder to 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 arrest someone for for drunk driving incident and then most of the time they get off anyways and are allowed to get into a car you know a second and a third dui and a fourth dui yeah. and even when i see on facebook people posting saying hey checkpoint on on the intersection between this street and this street are, are you insane it's it's it serves one purpose and one purpose only is to make sure that innocent civilians don't get killed and and people are, are letting other people know where these checkpoints are it's insane yeah it really is it really so it's become your mission to spread the word and educate uh, americans specifically about this horrific situation yeah it, it really has and because I, I made a promise to myself and, and my wife as well that I'm going to make sure that losing my son was my, – my son's life was not just a statistic. My son was not just one of the victims getting killed every 53 minutes. My, because of my son, there will be change. Because of what happened to Liam, there, there will be a major change in both the social attitude and the legal side as well. Uh, our, our goal is to lower the legal blood alcohol content from 0.08 to 0.04. Um, and someone asked me, well, why wouldn't you want zero tolerance as like Sweden? And, and of course, that's the ultimate goal. But you've mm -hmm. got to take it in steps. That's you true. can't go 0.08 to 0.02 in one, one sitting. But, you know, we're up against lobbyists. We're up against politicians that are being written checks to defend the 0 0.08. But, you know, there's a lot of laws in this country that are different that i don't agree with and you know americans are torn on certain um laws as well and the the thing is there's always a counter argument and even though you don't agree with the counter argument you have to respect the counter argument right. but when it comes to drunk driving there is no counter argument and i might and i want to make it very clear my fight is not against alcohol i of course you know i know what the there's, there's a lot of trouble. There's a reason why there's more fights at 2 a.m. outside of nightclubs than at 8 p.m. Because, you know, people drink and they don't think rational and, and the temper, uh, the fuse becomes a little bit shorter and so on. But my fight is not against alcohol. My fight is against getting behind the wheel mm -hmm. when you've been drinking. And there is no counter argument for that. No, you're right. You're right. I mean, what could someone say to try to fight for that? It's It's crazy. So I admire, I, I admire and respect you for trying to find some meaning and purpose and some good that can come from such a, a tragic um, situation. So hats Thank on to you, you and, and, and fully support that. You've recently had uh, an event uh, or challenge to raise awareness about Liam's life. So tell us about that, the year-long event you've had and how that uh, came to a, to a head recently. We uh, we actually did two. the 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 most recent one we want, we did there was uh, uh, there was a Swedish fighter, Muay Thai fighter, who lives in Thailand. Who um, he's he's a minimalist and lives like it, the Thais, and uh, wanted to do something for my son because we were down in Thailand training, and he met my son and spent time with him and played with him, and he asked if it was okay if he did a hundred kicks for seven days straight for for my son. And I said, of course, you know, it was very nice of him. And more people started doing it and more and more and more. And it just, it became a viral campaign, a social media campaign where people were doing 100 kicks a day for seven days straight and then challenging three people a day, similar to the ice bucket challenge or the 22 push-ups a day for, mm -hmm. for vets with PTSD. And, you know, it went worldwide and, and it was crazy to see people around the world that, I didn't know but they were kicking for my son and uh, wow. um, you know at, at times I would just say and watch these videos from Japan Singapore you know from Iran and uh, it, absolutely crazy and I, I you know I I got challenged and I did the seven days of, of the kicks and it didn't feel enough I didn't feel like I'd done enough for my son so I decided to throw 100 kicks for a year and as the end of the year started to approach you know, it, it, it became because of the first guy who did the kicks, he just did the kicks. It was no music, nothing else. And then people started, you know, editing the videos and putting music with it. And what I started doing was I would give a fact every single day about Liam um, because there were so many people that didn't have a chance to meet Liam, but felt like they knew him. So I wanted them to get a chance to get to know Liam a little bit. But also it's a way for me to give a memory every single day because that's all we have left of Liam. You know, and with time, 
memories fade and and normally you would make new memories but we don't get the opportunity to make more new memories so it was a way for me to to give these memories and to have them forever but i also would give a, a fact about drunk driving or organ donation which is another thing that we work on with liamslife.org because we donated my son's organs and that's another problem you know i didn't know at the time that um uh, 22 people a day die in the United States waiting for an organ. Uh, 94% of the U.S. population say they're willing to donate their organs, yet only 54% of the population actually are organ donors. That's and crazy. you couldn't fill it, it is, and and you couldn't fill the Yankee Stadium with all the people that are on the list, desperate waiting for an organ. Oh so gosh. that's why I would give facts about organ donation and drunk driving and. As we started to approach the end of the year, and you know, it, it was a lot of work. You know, even if I was sick, even if I was exhausted, if I was traveling, I had to do these hundred kicks every single day. Um, but as it was approaching the end, you know, I, I realized that it was, it was, it was something that I had done every single day to to honor my son. It was something that I did for Liam. Thank you. And I had to find. I, I I didn't want it to just be a year, and that was it. So. We had set another world record that, uh, with Guinness Book of Records, which I can talk about in a second, but we wanted to set one more where I said, I'm going to do 100 kicks on the hour, every hour for 24 hours. And I wanted to do the kicks with gyms around the world. And people did it from Africa to Turkey, um, you know, Sweden, Thailand. People were doing these 100 kicks. And I would tune in on the hour. I did it on Facebook Live. And some, because of the time difference, it actually ended up being 27 hours. So for 27 hours, we threw the kicks. And the last 100 kicks that we did, we did back at the gym uh, systems training center in Hawthorne, which is where the accident happened. And the mayor came out and the police shut down the street so we can go out in the street where Liam was killed and do the last um, 100 kicks. Incredible. The same street. I Thank watched you. a lot of that on your live feeds. It was really cool to see so many people getting behind it and, and contributing and doing this and participating in it. Really, really cool. Thank you. Thank you. It, it was, you know, the, the social support and network that we've had over the past year is absolutely amazing. And it's a, it's a network I wish I never had to find out mm -hmm. that we had. But it's been one of the few positive things over the past year, that's for sure. And it's been a big part and a big help in, in contributing to our healing process as well. Absolutely. Well, I'll definitely put the link in the show notes. Uh, everybody go there, find out more about this, sign the petition and support Liam's life uh, as much as possible. Thank you. And that's the thing, you know, when it, when it comes to, to a lot of important things uh, and you know a lot of people nowadays they they like things on facebook and they and they share it perhaps and and that's that and feel like they've done their part i i, I heard the term uh, clicktivist um but it, it's so important that that we do more and a lot of times we feel like we can't make a difference because it's in the hands of politicians, it's in the hands of lobbyists and so on. But that's not true. Politicians answer to us. And I can tell you, because of the martial art community, I know that we'll make a difference. Just because of how the martial art community has gotten behind our course and been there for us. Another world record that was set in December, December 2nd of 2016, so about three months after my son's passing, we did uh, 24 hours of jujitsu. Mm -hmm. So I was on the mat. I did 105 five-minute rounds in 24 hours. Wow. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't nervous about finishing the 24 hours. Well, you know, if you get injured and can't do it. But I wasn't sure if people were going to show up, like any event that you have, right? And uh, it was absolutely incredible with people like, you know, Heron and Henry Gracie, Fabrice Verdum, um Mac Danzig, Chris Esquiago, a bunch of UFC fighters that came out as well, as well as the, doing the 100 kicks from Cub Swanson to Uriah Faber, TJ Dillashaw. They all did the 100 kicks. And, you know, it, it's it's because of the martial art world, because martial artists tend to be doers. Yes. And I know, I know we won't stop until change comes. Yeah, the martial arts are truly a, a brotherhood. And it's so great that everybody was willing to 
support it. And like you said, uh, they're doers. So yeah. that's what they're going to do. So wonderful, wonderful. So let's change gears for a moment, uh, Marcus, and talk about uh, your background. You grew up in Sweden. Tell us about how you got introduced and started in the martial arts and kind of where that took you, what the journey's been like, and how that eventually brought you over to the uh, the States. So I, I was born in Sweden and lived in Sweden until I was 15. And then we moved to England, to Birmingham, which the only way I can compare it to is, is Detroit of the United States. And I went to school in a rough area called Chelmsford Wood, which is the equivalent of Compton or South Central, I would say. So... I, I didn't hang with the right crowd and uh, I, I think uh, or the, the main reason why I wanted to start doing martial arts was for the wrong reasons. I just wanted to learn how to fight better. Um, and I dabbled a little bit with Aikido and Karate and I didn't like it because I'm a, I've always been a competitive person. I like to compete playing soccer, you know, ice hockey growing up and I wanted to be able to measure myself. So I found kickboxing and, and fell in love with it and uh, started training in England, in Birmingham, and then uh, I moved back to Sweden again for a year, and I started boxing as well. And I just wanted to box to improve my hands for kickboxing, but then I fell in love with boxing as well, and I started boxing, and I would fight one week boxing, and next week kickboxing. And after I was done with university, I moved back to England yet again and finished university there. And I decided to move. I was either going to move to Cuba or to Mexico because that's where the, they had the best boxers. And the best professional boxers uh, at my weight class were in Mexico. So I moved down to Mexico, not speaking a word of Spanish. And uh, I lived down there for two years and I made my pro debut in kickboxing. And someone asked me if, if money was good in uh, kickboxing over there. I said, I, I definitely not. I would have made more money at the time working at McDonald's than <laughs> yeah. fighting professional kickboxing in, in Mexico. But I just love fighting. You know, I just loved it and I wanted to do it. And, um, and the experience, I'm sure, was worth a ton. Absolutely. Mexicans are so tough. You know, the warriors. And you see, you know, some of the best fighters in boxing in the world come from Mexico. And it's it's just that the, the heart that, that Mexican fighters tend to have. And um, I remember I know I punched pretty hard for my weight. And uh, I was used to landing hard shots. And, and it would have an effect. And down there, they would just smile and continue fighting. So <laughs> <laughs> Nice, nice. Yeah, I know a little bit about the resiliency and the toughness of the, the Mexican people. I was in the Army, and I was stationed on the border in El Paso, Texas, on the border of Texas, in Juarez, Mexico. So I spent a lot yeah. of time there and eventually had an apartment there for a little while. Really loved the Mexican people, beautiful people, but like you said, very tough. And, and I wasn't in the, the ring with them like you. <laughs> yeah, they, they're absolutely amazing. You know, I, it's it's funny because I grew up in the suburbs of Sweden, which – here in America, being from the suburbs is a nice thing, and Sweden is not. And I thought that I'd seen, you know, toughness and, and so on, but nothing compared to Mexico, you know, and the poverty that you see down there. Mm -hmm. Yet yeah, the people are happy because yes. they're very social people, and, and even if they don't have a lot, they'll invite you in. And, and I, I remember even feeling embarrassed that they were trying to feed me, you know, give me food and meat when I knew that, that they didn't have a lot. They'd hardly had enough food for the family and you know my time I, it's funny because I am from Sweden I feel that I have a connection to England obviously from living there for six years seven years and uh, uh, but I also feel I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, adopted Mexican and uh, um, it, it, it's you know you, you get a lot of times you, you hear about bad stuff uh, about you know cartels and so on but you know, it's a lot of poverty, and at times you have, you have poverty, you you will have criminals come from it as well. But the Mexican people, they've been through so much, and they're so tough. Just seeing how they reacted this time around with the with the with the earthquake, right? And uh, they're just very resilient people. Yes, I agree, and I, and I that was my experience as well, especially with like you described them not having anything, but being just totally willing to give to you. And so I had that <clears> same experience, and I, I was able to spend Christmas one year with a family down there, which was really, really cool. Nice. What, what uh, division were you with in the in the military? I was in the 3rd Armor Cavalry Regiment. So it was a tanker unit, and I was in communications, and then uh, later on went to a combat medic school. Oh, nice. I was in the military in Sweden as well, in the Army. What did you do? 
Uh, I was uh, with the Rangers over there. All right. Um, Go get that's them, actually man. the reason. The reason why I came to the United States originally was so was to join the military here. So mm. it's a long story, but um, I my my social is a military social. Your social is a military social. Yeah. So my social security number is from the military. Ah, so interesting. Um, yeah. So people that recognize that you can see it's a, it's a military social that I have because um, I was going to join the military and uh, that was pre 9-11 and then 9-11 um, happened and, and everything changed when as far as foreigners coming in mm. and, and getting uh, so I sat at the military base I was supposed to sign a four-year contract and then um, you know after three weeks I just said you guys I can't just sit around but I, I was so set on moving to the United States. So I went back to Sweden and thinking, what am I going to do now? And I just Googled sports management. And uh, a few, I had my undergraduate from England and I wanted to do my master's, but I didn't want to be a PE teacher per se. So I Googled sports management and found a few schools and I realized I wanted to go somewhere where there was where it was warm, the beaches were nice, and I can continue my fighting career. And no better place for that than than Los Angeles, obviously. True, true. It's like the Mecca, right? Yeah. So you settled in uh, Los Angeles area and uh, had a pretty successful fighting career. Yeah, you know, I, it's funny because I got in pretty late to mixed martial arts because, you know, I was so set on boxing and, and kickboxing and that's what I wanted to do and that's what I wanted to turn pro in. And um, then... Um, I was at the original LA Boxing where Sugar Shane Mosley was from. De La Hoya used to be down there, Chiquenito Hernandez. And uh, Van de Braga, who uh, I believe he had a couple of fights in the UFC, but then he had some problems with his visa. Um, he was getting ready to fight the late Joe Camacho. And he asked me, hey, would you mind you know, doing some stand-up sparring with me? In return, I'll teach you ground. And this is early 2000, and, and UFC wasn't very big. And I said, you know what, I'll be happy to to help you get ready for your fight and I'll do some stand-up sparring with you but I don't really want to do the ground stuff it doesn't interest me and then one time we were done training he said you know come we'll just we'll we'll play around a little bit with the jiu-jitsu and he tapped me without using his hands just using oh, his legs wow. nice, <laughs> nice. and um, then I thought you know what if I can only learn a little bit of this ground stuff especially at the time you know there was there was not really anyone I wouldn't be willing to to strike with um Nowadays, you know, the level of, of stand-up uh, is much higher than it was back then. So I started training. I figured if I'm going to do it, I might as well do it with the best. I was lucky enough to uh, be close to Hickson Gracie's school when it was on Wilshire when he was still living in Los Angeles. So I started training there, and I, a lot of my friends were training there, and I got some really high-level training from a, from a from an early onset. And then uh, – but I, I – didn't really like learning technique at first. I just wanted to roll. So uh, it's funny when you see my jujitsu. Uh, first of all, it's a lot better no gi than gi, obviously, because of the fight career. But um, I'm a lot better at defending uh, submissions than than perhaps going for submissions myself, just because I spent the first two years on my back just getting choked out. <laughs> Yeah, so you had to learn to survive and uh, defend. So, but you know what? That's that's so much more important than actually pulling off the submission. Because if you can survive and not be submitted, you know you can always go to your your number one, which is which is the striking anyway, right? Yes, sir. Back that was that advantageous position for yourself to to implement your will. Yeah, and that's you know. So I started doing jujitsu. It took me some time to really fall in love with jujitsu, but when I did. I really fell in love with it because, you know, it's, it's said that boxing is a human chess, but the truth is jiu-jitsu is a human chess where you really plan each move and every action has a reaction and every reaction is a counter to the counter, right? So um, I really fell in love with jiu-jitsu as well. And, um, and, and you know, now... Uh, uh, now I've had a lot of injuries, but I I, I still I compete in jujitsu as well, and um, and and I love doing jujitsu. I love the, the the mindset. I love the lifestyle. I love the camaraderie that that jujitsu uh, creates. Nice, and you're pretty well rounded. You love jujitsu. You certainly very versed striker, and um, you put it all together. You do you teach MMA as well as what all do you? Uh, do
Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, MMA, um, and Krav Maga, CrossFit, and Yoga. Wow. Full service. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I'm a CrossFit instructor as well. And, you know, um, one thing that was important for me, I, I love CrossFit because obviously CrossFit has done a lot for for fitness in, in general worldwide and uh, in a very short period of time. And um, uh, But at the same time, I didn't want our school to be, how do I say this in a nice way, not so bro -y. Um, you know, it, we didn't want it to be the the kind of uh, some some gyms you get the clicks and people that come in might be intimidated, not feel welcome. We really wanted it to be for anyone and everyone. Mm. And uh, I think CrossFit is great for MMA and Jiu Jitsu in general, but I also know its limitations, and that's important to know that you know that CrossFit isn't the end all to all fitness. You know, there's a lot of other things, especially as a fighter, that you need as well. You need the agility, the athleticism, and so on. That uh, that CrossFit is is great for the mindset of saying, okay, this is what's going to be done, and I'm going to do it. And also, you know, strength, general strength. But as a fighter, you need more athleticism as well. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. I'm just uh, finishing up an episode. Uh about yoga and jiu-jitsu and that point's made quite a bit uh, a lot of the guys that spoke on this episode talk about you know they were into really heavy heavy lifting but eventually got to the point where you know the movement and the suppleness and things like that were, were a lot more beneficial and the, the kind of functional fitness was a lot more beneficial than just straight up you know, heavy strength training absolutely and you're right you know my, my wife michelle is a yoga instructor and when I was younger, I didn't used to spend a lot of time stretching. And um, as we get older and injuries and so on, you know, I, I think it's important to have that yin to your yang. And mm -hmm. it's actually something that I focus on is yin yoga. I don't go to classes, but I, I, I'm I, lucky enough to have a wife that can show me uh, positions and moves. And then I just hold them a little bit longer because everything that we do is so explosive yeah. and it shortens our muscles so much. that It's important to, to hold positions a little bit longer and uh, one thing that I found um, during this year as well is meditation. And mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Belisa, who I know that you know as well and have had on the show, has been very helpful w with that. And uh, the combination of yoga with meditation is it's not just good for, for lengthening the muscles and, and preventing injuries. It's just good for your heart and soul as well. Absolutely right. And you mentioned Dr. Belisa. Yeah, we, I know you've trained with her. I have two and can't say enough about that. And I assume you are into the breathing, having trained with her and know the importance of breathing, not only to just general health, but also in martial arts. So what part does that play in your training? Um, you know, it's it's funny with fighters in general. I, I, I think that's always been one of my strengths. That's the mental strength. I've always been very calm in fights and... Um, uh, it, it's something that I look to as one of my strengths. And even, you know, I wish I never would have been tested the way I was tested in this past year. But I think I've handled it in as healthy of a way as losing a child, uh, of losing a child as, as, as you possibly can. Um, and But I know a lot of fighters, we call them gym warriors, you know, they're absolutely amazing in training. And then they can't put it together and fight. And then you have other people who are the opposite. They're okay in training, and then when it comes, when fight day, day comes, they just they just game bread, you know. And I know you see it in other sports and other aspects of life too, where people just have performance anxiety. And uh, it's funny when this fight game is such a mental game, yet fighters spend so little time focusing on it, which is incredible. And when you know, everyone talks about, you know, having stamina and, and having heart well, and, and being an intelligent fighter. Well, when your stamina is out the window, when, when you don't have enough gas in your gas tank, then your, your, your brain doesn't work the way it's supposed to because you're not getting enough oxygen. And it um, doesn't matter how good your technique is because it's going to be out the window. And the last thing, that heart, if there's not oxygen in your system – your heart crawls out of that cage and sits on the outside of the cage and watches you, and uh, that's not a good place. <laughs> that's true. That's a good way to put it, man. Good way to put it. I'm excited because the breathing has become just a huge passion of mine, and I'm actually working on a, a video program 
called Breathing for Jiu-Jitsu. And uh, Dr. Belise is kind of consulting with me on that and um, collaborating. So definitely let you know more about that when it's when it's done. I'll please do, yeah. So you also wrote a book. Tell us about that. Yes, sir. Um, I, I started writing four days after the accident. Someone had recommended me said, you know, it's – it's it's good to write and i'm not a writer i've written quite a few articles on martial arts and self-defense and fitness and so on and um being a commentator for mma for we were media partners with the ufc for ufc in sweden for example but you know this was some something so very different because when i started writing i, I really poured my my soul onto the paper and really wrote in an honest way and after meeting parents and especially dads, uh, I realized a lot of times uh, dads would very often turn to alcohol and drugs. Uh, not all, obviously. I met some amazing fathers who've done exactly what I've done, but it, it was fairly common. And I don't condone it, but I, I, I understand it. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I understand it is because the pain is so immense. It doesn't compare to anything. And it's not physical pain it's emotional pain and emotional pain there's no rhyme or reason to it you know one day you feel like you're doing better and then the next day you feel like life has no meaning so writing became one of the ways that i i was i was dealing with grief and between the 100 kicks a day martial arts and the great social network i had around me writing became my my, my savior and i wrote the book in english and uh What's funny is when I decided for it to become a book, I didn't have necessarily that in mind when I started writing. Um, I decided I, I, I had some people read it and someone said, uh, you know, I think this could be a very, very important book because there's a lot of books out there uh, about griefs, but mostly written by women and, and women losing children. And I, I think, you know, especially from working with Krav Maga and being a Krav Maga instructor, working a lot with military and so on. When you when you have, you know, vets coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq and they're struggling with PTSD and they've seen their friends and um, die next to them, uh, they might not be willing or likely to pick up one of these books. But I think, you know, the stigma of being a fighter, even though not true, uh, is that, you know, you're, you're tough and macho or whatever. But I, I think they might be more likely to pick up my book. And, and even though it's... You know, it's a sad book. It's about losing my son. I think it can be inspiring to some to to be able to find happiness because that's basically what it's about. It's about finding happiness again. And um, I, I said it very early on. You know that that is my goal. We are going to be happy again, both me and my wife. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's it's something that's going to be with us for the rest of our lives. But the way I look at it, you know, it's survivor's guilt is something that's very, very common. And Michelle's sister struggle, still struggles with it and she still has PTSD. But and Michelle had it as well and a lot of guilt and I didn't feel it. And, you know, we went to see a therapist and she asked, well, don't you feel it? I said, no, I, I don't. And and the reason why, you know, those, the way I look at it is it's a road that we didn't choose, but that we're on right now. And my eyes are going to stay focused on, on the light in the front of us, which is happiness. And there's a lot of side roads. And it's very easy to, to slide down those side roads and the what ifs and if only, you know. And the thing is, those those side roads, they're, they're toxic, you know. Yeah. If, because you can sit there and, and, and you, you want to go back in time and you want to do things differently, but you can't. And going back in time is not is not is not an option. And standing still in time is not an option. So your only option is to go forward, and that's that's what we've been doing is keeping our eyes uh, in front of us and and focusing on the goal ahead. And one of the ways I, I look at it is if you know if I know Liam right, that's that's what he wants. You know, he wants me and my wife to be happy again. And and if it was the other way around, where if I would have passed away and Liam was alive. I would have wanted him to lead a, a, a happy and positive life. Yes. I wouldn't want him to forget me, but I would want him to be happy. So um, that's why I, I think I've been able to to do that and uh, continue forward uh, in, in a healthy manner. And uh, the book actually just came out last Monday in, in Sweden. And uh, 
I just did an interview not long ago and someone said uh, when I'm going to translate it into English. But the truth is, I actually wrote the book in English. And the only reason why it came out in Swedish first is because we have a publisher who I love success in Sweden that, that picked up the book. Whereas here in the in the US, uh, I have an agent um, who is is shopping the book around to to uh, publishing houses going the, the traditional route. So if any publishers are listening to this, the book is, is available. And, um, you know, someone asked me in an interview in a Swedish newspaper last week when it was coming out, asking if I was nervous about the book coming out. And I said, not, not really. Of course, when you spend, you know, it took a year for it to come out. When, when you get people reading something that you have spent a year on doing and hundreds of hours uh, and it's something so honest and, and so personal, then you obviously want people to, to appreciate it. But at the same time, it doesn't make or break my career. I'm not necessarily going to be an author. I have other businesses and other things I work on. Right. But and, and the book isn't just, I think it can help someone. And that's the biggest honor for me if someone writes to me and says, thank you, your book helped me. And I think it can help people. But at the same time, Half of the reason was that. And the other half of the reason was it's just a tribute. It's just to honor my son that wrote that book. So even if it doesn't sell, I, I, you know, I'll be okay anyways. I, I love your attitude. And even if it doesn't sell, it was therapeutic and you needed to write it. And, and it, just the resiliency you have and the way you've dealt with all this, very healthy. I mean, you've reached out and you've employed a lot of different things from the social network to the different, you know, all these different things you've really done and, and your attitude of just moving forward instead of falling down to one of these side roads is, is awesome. I think it's a really Thank important you. book because, like you said, there's there are books on grief, and but there's not a whole lot out there from a man's perspective for men or that could really touch the man's soul, so to speak. So I think that's very important, and I'm, I'm really glad that you wrote it. It's very important to work. Thank you. And it, it's very honest. I talk a lot about, you know, and like you said, men. As I remember I spoke to one guy who lost his brother at a very young age. And this was back in the late 70s. And he said his dad never spoke of his brother ever again. And I think back then, especially, that was how you would deal with it. Mm -hmm. You would move on and you wouldn't talk about it. But that's not healthy. You know, you, you've got to you've got to talk about it. It's 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 therapeutic and it's 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 necessary and um you know i i remember the last time i cried before this happened you know it was 10 years prior when, when my grandma passed away and before that was 10 years before that when my other grandma passed away um uh, and it's not that I, I i in a macho way or anything like that it was just that i'm i'm a pretty happy person and i don't usually cry and um you know for <laughs> For the first year, or I, well, at least the first six months, I cried every single day and several times a day. And writing the book, you know, I cried myself through the book. And and the thing is, it's, it's okay to cry, you know, and Absolutely. it's okay for men to talk about emotions. And I think a lot of times we we think it's not okay and it's it's we're too macho to do it. And mm -hmm. you know, hopefully, you know, some kid will pick up the book and and say, wait, if, if this guy can talk about his emotions, why couldn't I? That's true, and that's why I think it's so important. There's, there's so much of the male society uh, that feels like they have to save face or be strong, and and that it's weak to show their emotions. In reality, it's it takes a lot more strength to show your emotions, and it's a lot more healthy yeah. if you just stay, you know, keep it all in and don't share it with anybody and don't let it out. Man, it, it'll destroy you. So it, it takes a Absolutely. lot, a lot more strength, and it's a lot healthier to show those emotions. Thank you. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. And the way I look at it is, you know, you can you can numb yourself with drugs and alcohol or you can try to pent it up and comp uh, compartmentalize it. Uh, but it's going to come out. It has to come out one way or another. And it's almost like a big, dark cloud, almost like a hurricane of emotions. And you've got to go through it and you don't have to go straight through it, which I kind of did. Um, you can take time and you know, and and this is my shortcoming when it came to to the grievance and and how to deal with it because I've learned from a therapist, for example, that you know the part of the brain that handles 
physical pain is the same part of the brain that hand, handles emotional pain. So from fighting for so many years, I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, I absorbed it and kept moving forward and I absorbed it and I kept moving forward. But I also am used to training. The harder you train, the better you get. And I would try to do that. And there was one day where I think it was about a month and a half after the accident, you know, I started going and going and going. We we buried our son on September 12th and the following morning at 6 a.m. I met with a lawyer to set up a non-profit, liamslife.org. And uh, I just kept going and I couldn't get out of bed. You know, I, I couldn't. And I wasn't sick. I wasn't. I just could not move. And I had to learn to to accept that and that that was okay too. And um, that certain days were going to be tougher. And those days you, you just have to listen to your body and you've got to listen to your mind. And But there's a fine line because if I had listened to it all the time, I would have just stayed in bed and not mm-hmm. done anything. So, you know, we had three gyms at the time. To Now we have four gyms, but we had three gyms that still needed um, help. And luckily we have some great, you know, members of the team at Systems Training Center that were there for us and helped taking care of the businesses when we couldn't. You know, the first three, four months, you know, I was catatonic. I couldn't get much done. But and and motivation to work with what I loved wasn't there anymore. You know, my motivation was just to remember Liam, to to do things for Liam. So yeah. it was um, it was a tough tough time. But like I said, I've, I've learned a lot about myself in the past past year. And you do have some additional information about what's transpired in your life, meaning your the birth of your is a son or daughter, a little son. Uh, you're right, two and a half months ago. He's actually we're at, at, at our Encino gym today, and he's in out of the room. And you know, Nico being born was the the brightest light in a very dark tunnel in the past year. And uh, you know, when Liam was born, I. I think the day of his birth in the hospital I posted, uh, I, I, the only thing I wish is that he can be a good human being and make this world a little bit more positive. And uh, at the time, it wasn't in this way or form or shape that I wanted him to do that, obviously. But Liam, the name Liam means the people's protector. Mm. And, you know, it's become very true that, you know, he's already saved lives directly through organ donation but indirectly as well from all the people that have heard his story and people writing pledges to us saying they promise they're never going to drink and drive again and us being out speaking at high schools and to police departments and so on but also because so many people were involved in our fight and got involved with with sharing our pain with with liam that when Nico was born, Nico means uh, the people's victory. So wow. uh, the name Nico felt right because it wasn't just our victory. It was the people's victory. And, uh, um, you know, with Lee as well, people would say, oh, it's going to be an amazing fighter. You know, he's growing up at the gym. I said, to be honest, I didn't really want to be a fighter. If he wanted to be a fighter, I wouldn't stop him. But, um you know, my parents always struggle with me being a fighter, and I completely understand it. You love your child. You don't want your child to be to get hurt or injured in any form or shape. Um, and same with Liam. And I, I, if I wanted to be a ballerina, I could be a ballerina as long as he did his best and tried to be as good of a version as he possibly could be. And, uh, you know, uh, being an entrepreneur and, and owning a few different businesses – it's it's a lot of work but being a father was always number one and uh, i posted a picture from me and liam on the beach uh in july a couple of months before the accident and i i written on, on instagram it's a picture of me and him building a sand castle at the beach and i wrote building a dream is important but building sand castles with him is more important mm-hmm. um and, and it's very 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 true you know it's for me, it was the proudest moment in my life to become a, a father. And uh, um, you know, uh, when 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 Nico was born, it was it was it was amazing. But it, it also comes with a lot of difficulties that normally uh, having a baby doesn't. You know, normally little brother inherits older brother's hand-me-downs and, and toys and so on. And um, this time around, we have to be a little bit careful. You know, it's important for Nico to have his own identity to to know that he's his own person 
and know that he has an older brother and to be proud of his older brother, but never feel like he lives in the shadow of his brother. Very true. Very true. Well, man, I really want to thank you so much for your time and your your heart, your truth, and your courage to really open up and, and let us know about your life and your journey and, and your struggles. Uh, very powerful, very powerful stuff, and I really do appreciate it. Anybody you want to thank or shout out to before we close, Marcus? I, I do want to thank uh, Dr. Belisa for all the amazing work she did with us meditation-wise and uh, the martial art community, especially in Los Angeles, the people that have been out there and doing things for us, but also worldwide. I don't care. You know, there's this, a lot of times politics and martial arts as well, and there shouldn't be because that's exactly what we all try to get away from when we go on the mat. I don't care if it's if it's striking or jujitsu or grappling or whatever it is, um, martial art is about opening doors, not closing them. And, you know, we, we learn on the mat that it doesn't matter what religion you are, what, what ethnicity you are, what political party you belong to. And in a world that a lot of times feels like there's a lot of hatred, it's important to remember that, you know, for martial artists, be a true martial artist, not just a fighter, but a martial artist and, try to make this world a little bit better and, and with a non-profit i hope that people can keep following our fight liam's life dot org or on instagram it's um it's remember liam on instagram uh remember liam's life sorry at remember liam's life and um uh, just you know whether it's law enforcement or civilians telling their friends not to drink and drive uh, sign up to be an organ donor it takes two minutes you can do it online and uh um the book will be out in English in a few months, so uh, stay tuned for that. That's it. Definitely, definitely. Well, you're an inspiration and a class act, and I really do appreciate all that you brought and for the impact that you're making around the world. So thank you very much, Marcus. Take care, brother. Thank you, Marty. Bye-bye. Okay, really enjoyed that conversation with Marcus. What an interesting person he is, and what an awesome mission is on. Next up is the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. And today we'll be featuring the audio portion of a video titled Prove Them Wrong. So enjoy. that I have ever heard came from people who told me I couldn't do something. You know why? Because when they told me I couldn't do it, I was bound and determined to show them that I could. Tell me I can't do it. I will prove you wrong. I will show you. survive. We're not made to manage our pain or get through it. We're made to be creators of our lives. We can create anything, anything we can dream about, we can create. How much of life do you feel like you control? Or how much does life control you? Do you tend to control more of what's going on or events controlling you? It's very easy to have those events start to take control. Unless we take control of what's between our ears, our own mind. You see, what you and I focus on massively affects how we feel, whether we're thriving or surviving. If you focus on what you can't control, if you focus on the past, if you focus on what's missing from your life constantly, that pattern of focus will make you frustrated, overwhelmed, depressed. Focus equals power. If you want to thrive, you've got to focus on what you can control. You've got to focus on the difference you can make. You've got to focus on what's already in your life that you're grateful for. Most people allow their fear of failure, 80%, allow their fear of failure to outweigh their desire to succeed. When you're willing to fail again and again and again, when you 
make up your mind to become unstoppable, when you make up your mind to become a no matter what person, then that will then give birth to a part of yourself that you don't know right now. Set some higher goals. Reach for some higher purpose. Go for something beyond what you thought you could do. You've got to believe that tomorrow can be better than today. But here's the big one. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Ask for wisdom to deal with the challenges of today and tomorrow. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Wish you were better. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. Hope you're enjoying the show. If you feel like you're benefiting from the show and want to show your support, you can support us on our Patreon page and the link in the show notes. Please like and follow us on social media and help us spread the word by reposting our posts and telling others about the show. You can leave comments on the website at www.racyjujitsurocks.com. You can also go to iTunes and leave comments as well as rate the show. And we would appreciate a five-star rating, which helps us with our standing in iTunes. You can also leave comments on our YouTube channel. If you have suggestions for the show, please don't hesitate to give those. We always like feedback and suggestions. Okay, that's going to do it. So until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.